This video is better on Nebula, both because there are no ads and because you can follow it up with an exclusive recording of a live talk I recently gave at my local library. Okay, shh, now the video's starting for real. Sometimes huge feels bigger than infinite. Let me explain. No Man's Sky is more or less infinite. A space game with 18 quintillion planets, a number that, while not technically limitless, approaches the number of planets in our actual universe, a figure so unfathomably large that it shoots right past meaninglessness. I can no more easily conceptualize one quintillion planets than 18, or even a billion. It is so big that words fail. But allow me to present a counterexample, a game that has stuck in my brain for years. The racing game Fuel. Developed by Asobo Studios in 2009, Fuel is a fairly middling racing game with mediocre handling and weird opponent AI. And yet, Fuel has a serious claim to fame. The game's map is 14,400 square kilometers or 5,500 square miles. This is obscene. I have thought about fuel for more than a decade now, simply because of this staggering number. 120 clicks long, 120 clicks wide, thousands upon thousands of tracks to race upon in the middle. That's 370 times larger than Skyrim, 200 times as large as GTA V. It is so big, that the entirety of a real-scale Mount Rainier sits on the top of the map and hardly even dominates the space. It is as big as Connecticut, or Puerto Rico. And this number still basically rounds down to zero in comparison to something like No Man's Sky or Elite Dangerous, but it sure doesn't feel like zero when you can pick one direction and drive for literally hours. It doesn't feel like zero when you watch one biome gradually melt into another over the course of miles of road. You might have recognized the name Asobo Studios from another game. They went on to develop Microsoft Flight Simulator 2020, a game that literally contains a one-to-one -one scale model of the Earth, one of the most staggering technical achievements I've ever seen. In hindsight, Fuel seems like a test run for this, a huge game created using a mix of procedural generation and satellite imagery that can, somehow, run on console. And while I love Flight Simulator, and have written about it at length, I think this makes Fuel the stranger cultural object. Unlike Flight Simulator, or No Man's Sky, or Elite Dangerous, you don't have access to vehicles that can cross vast distances near instantly. You have a car, a grounded, limited car, to cover this landmass, and because your perspective and options are so limited, Fuel still, to me, manages to feel big in a truly radical way. In the decade after Fuel's release, two other racing games with similar missions came out, Ubisoft's The Crew and The Crew 2. Unlike Fuel, which covers an undefined portion of post-climate disaster America, The Crew makes its map explicit. It is the whole country, from east coast to west, tip to tail. Kinda. The maps of the crew games are large, but not nearly as large as Fuel, let alone the United States. To adjust for this, the America of the crew looks a little like one of those draw the country from memory maps. You can map the road trip of your dreams in this game, but charting a route from, for instance, LA to San Francisco will reveal that one is about 10 miles away from the other. The graphics and detail are a significant jump from Fuel, but in a way that only highlights the artifice. You can hilariously visit many landmarks in the crew, like Mount Rushmore, which happens to be in a Denny's parking lot, or Mesa Verde, maybe, or my favorite, Niagara Falls, which has been made so modest you can drive over the top of it. Cities demonstrate the same artifice in a slightly different way. Storefronts display what appear to be the average of all possible commercial writing, like this one that boasts 
50% off. Buy one, get second one. T-shirts, four for five dollars, 15% off. Or this bookstore, with a large banner that simply says STORE, and smaller text detailing that it is actually a second-hand and antiquarian electric, or this gift shop that upon closer inspection is actually a grocery store, or this pizza place that has quote all flavors. The crew games, while easy to make fun of, are almost certainly more mechanically satisfying than fuel. The squashing of America down to a handful of iconic cities and the roads in between is a genuinely interesting idea to explore. But I still come back to fuel. Because while its cities are even less compelling than the crew and its driving kind of feels like butt, there's this indefinable power to just how big the game is. You can start driving through a dried up Grand Canyon and just keep going and going and going, the cliff walls stretching into the horizon. Fuel refuses to make the landscape small in order to increase density and visual diversity. Simultaneously, it doesn't push its procedural generation so far that it breaks human imagination, creating a quintillion planets consisting of the same basic tropes. It pulls a trick far more stubborn, and yet to me, far more compelling. It refuses to fake the space. If you are anything like me, you've probably googled biggest video game maps at some point and run into your own personal conflict. What counts as big? What's a cheat? What's a technicality? One of the biggest ever video game maps is The Elder Scrolls II Daggerfall, released on MS-DOS in 1996. Daggerfall looks like this, it's a world map like this, and is reportedly about the size of Great Britain. And I look at that and think, okay, sure, dude. Daggerfall has several large regions, and the landscape within those regions is entirely procedurally generated. The exceptionally patient YouTuber How Big Is The Map has a video walking across Daggerfall's landmass in real time, and the first of 15 videos in the playlist is seven and a half hours of trekking across identical gray mountains. Each generated world of Minecraft has the potential to be many, many times larger than Earth, but Minecraft is, of course, randomly and procedurally generated. The fact that there's essentially no authorship in a Minecraft world, or in the middle of the Daggerfall continent, lessens their impact. This rationalization of what feels big and what doesn't is made up and inherently imperfect. Fuel uses plenty of procedural generation. No human decided on the elevation of 14,000 kilometers of terrain. But Fuel's proc gen works in conjunction with satellite data, and the map is ironically small enough that it can still feel huge rather than meaningless. Essentially, what I'm saying here is I'm working more in the realm of what emotionally registers as big rather than the raw numbers. And while I've talked about map size as a whole thus far, I've actually more often found these moments awe at the sheer size of something hidden in more traditional levels. A single instance of bigness shattering the imposed reality of the rest of the setting. Am I speaking complete gibberish right now? As I'm writing this, I, I genuinely can't tell. Anyway, a lot of game development is creating the illusion of a holistic space and continuous progression out of several distinct pieces. I remember being mind blown many years ago watching one of these special features on God of War 2, in which they note that if a piece of level isn't visible, it simply doesn't exist. This makes sense for titles with a fixed camera like God of War, but it's not uncommon for any style of game to take what we might consider shortcuts, building environments based on what the player will see rather than real-world architecture. As digital explorers like the YouTube channel Boundary Break often find, even seemingly straightforward environments like the Office of the Stanley Parable are not as they seem. They're essentially games version of matte paintings or false building facades, ways to communicate a grander space while still staying within the constraints of budget and memory. Because games don't have to abide by real-life physics, they can have fun with this as well. The endless staircase in Mario 64 is an iconic example. 
Near the top of the castle, the player finds these stairs ascending into the dark and runs up them. The music continuously works its way higher and higher, the paintings rush by, and if you're 10 year old me, you might run up these stairs for minutes before turning around and realizing you haven't moved at all. It's a trick as simple as it is effective. Mario is being invisibly teleported backwards almost continuously, creating an illusion of infinite ascension with only a single flight. It's fun to think that even in the early days of 3D games, developers were already having fun with tricks of perspective and space. But there are counterexamples to this, a bigness that's not simply a mirage of clever programming. One of the best levels in Silent Hill 2, which by default makes it one of the best levels of all time, is the Historical Society. A museum located off the main road, the first few minutes in the Historical Society are almost normal, at least by Silent Hill standards. Photographs cover the walls of the entryway, offering a bit of background on the town, and of course your old pyramid-headed friend. It is punishingly dark, and a sort of foghorn emanates from the walls, but it's not until you walk through this hole smashed in a wall that the Historical Society tips its hand. Beyond the hole are stairs that go down and down and down. It is minutes of walking into the black. The foghorn gets more frequent. James' footfalls repeat endlessly. And then, with no celebration, you're at the bottom. In typical fashion, there's not even a big reveal at the end, just another office room. Mario's run up the stairs is accompanied by what's called a shepherd scale, a sort of musical illusion in which a series of notes can be made to climb infinitely by overlapping them an octave apart. The effect is bizarre, to say the least. Click around on a 10 minute loop of the track and every bit sounds identical, but listen to it continuously and you'll swear the notes are working their way up. But the tone can descend as well, as Gareth Damian Martin notes in their seminal piece, The Basement's Basement, Silent Hill 2's descent functions in much the same way as this scale. If you listen to a descending shepherd tone for any length of time, the feeling of being slowly dragged down, almost compressed, is unmistakable. It's that downward movement, the slow decay of a sound. How far can it continue, you ask yourself, how much deeper? but the tone is steady, its slow descent both rapidly falling and yet going nowhere at all. Following the staircase, James falls further into the earth, continuously choosing to jump down pits with nothing but dark at the bottom. Silent Hill relishes in the impossibility. After falling miles into the ground, you eventually emerge on the shores of a lake. The spatial absurdity is the point, rapidly falling, and yet going nowhere at all. But each pit James jumps into is accompanied by a cutscene and a loading screen, two embellishments that, while necessary, remove us just slightly from the environment. In those jumps, a reminder of Silent Hill's gaminess returns, that the environment is constantly being built around us instead of existing all at once. The staircase is different. There is no load, no movie, to separate us from it. And, as you might have guessed from this video's topic, the stair doesn't fake it. It's all there, every step rendered in real geometry at the same time. I worked with streamer Brosentia to capture this footage, and his other out-of-bounds footage is more what you'd expect. Half-built architecture, streets that end in nothing, 2D planes to portray distance. But the staircase is is just there. This thing is ridiculous, he told me. Nothing else is at all close to this. And I can't get this staircase out of my head, perhaps because the out-of-bounds footage is just as nightmarish as the in-game perspective. There is no illusion, no shepherd scale. James, in this moment, is walking into the bowels of the earth in as real a way as the game allows. Several iconic game moments center around nothing more than this sort of transitory environment, the liminal space, if you will, of an exceptionally long journey up or down a single object. 
the ladder after the end in Metal Gear Solid 3, the ladder back to Yosefka's clinic in Bloodborne, the climb up the stairs of the Shinra building in Final Fantasy VII, the elevator down into the Siafra River well in Elden Ring. Some of these are all there, as with Silent Hill 2. Some are pieced together from multiple different chunks. All are cool and memorable sequences. But when I think about enormous transitory spaces, there's only one that matches the energy of Silent Hill. Years ago, I talked about the indie game Naissance, an impersonal and unsettling trek through an endless, brutalist nowhere-scape. My first encounter with the game was in the magazine Heterotopius, fittingly also penned by Gareth Damian Martin. The game's developer said in that magazine that there are no invisible walls in Naissance, and thus, no security. This speaks to how I first experienced the game, it is a challenging, frustrating experience. But on a recent revisit, I took this no invisible walls statement as more of a challenge. Enabling flying in the console command certainly breaks the game progression, but it doesn't break the world nearly as much as you might think. It just keeps going. This mechanical chasm in the architecture is modeled well above and below what the player is ever able to normally see. In this endless row of identical blocks, you can fly for what feels like miles. This dark, electrical canyon has details a player would never find. But like Silent Hill 2, it's the big staircase that takes the cake. Towards the end of the game, you emerge from a dense ventilation network and are met with these white stairs, going up instead of down, but similarly shrouded in dark. So you start going up, and keep going up, or at least that's what you assume, because it's so punishingly dark that you can barely see the step in front of you, and you do this for minutes on end, even longer than the historical society, so long it seems they may truly never end, and then you're at the top. Like Silent Hill, the space defies all expectations. After the endless ascension, you emerge not on top of the mechanical expanse, but somehow at the bottom of a desert, your forever climb landing you in a place that feels lower than you started. The stairs are nonsense, they're impossible, and yet they are, also, all really there. Enabling a wireframe outline allows us to see through the dark, but even it can't display the true scale because the stairs simply fade from view. Like Silent Hill 2's descent, there's nothing lost by going out of bounds here. In fact, the construction is even more impressive, and even more preposterous. I've found this kind of thing more frequently in indie titles. The more big and expensive a game, the more often it needs to be absolutely optimized so it can squeeze every drop of hardware power into its intended visuals. In God of War 2, by making everything you can't see non-existent, everything you can see could receive that little extra oomph. But smaller, independent titles, either because they're not as graphically taxing or because they're not subject to the same terms of optimization, have space for all this extra stuff. Sometimes it feels like they're nothing but extra stuff. Sometimes that's the point. The game Babdi, released for free last year on Steam and Itch.io, is a game about the extra stuff. The objectives of Babdi are as straightforward as they could be. Get a ticket for the train. Tickets are sold out, so get one from your neighbor. Leave on the train. The appeal is instead the setting, this cold, concrete city block that is so much larger and more vertical than the stated goals of the game require. Babdi, the name of the city as well as the game, is a brutalist playground, a place where every balcony can be clamored over, and if you wander the underground enough, you might find people having a trash fire jukebox dance party. Or you might not. One of the strangely appealing things about Babdi is that as often as there's something to find, your curiosity can also take you into places that end without fanfare. The massive reservoir the city sits on is completely open, and although its corners hold no secrets, there's nothing to keep you out of it either. Eventually I found a pickaxe that allowed me to scale any wall, 
and my reward was just that, the intrinsic pleasure of finding that yes, every building has a roof, yes, with enough work, I can stand upon the tallest spire. Because Babdi so effectively communicates that every piece of it is real, every piece is there, I never even paused to wonder if the game would get in my way of exploration. Like its entire rundown vibe, the environment of the game feels more or less lawless, that there will be no artificial impediment to wherever you want to go. It's not massive in the way many game cityscapes are massive, it's 1% of a GTA map. But Babidi feels big, because its utilitarian art style implies that every building is truly there, Nothing is a hollow facade, nothing fancifully painted with the false textures of civilization. Maybe the best way I can put it is the objectives of the game aren't indicated by the design of the environment itself. The city doesn't seem built for the player to have an adventure in. It was built, existed, and then some time later, the player stumbled in. The language I've been using in this video is inherently flawed. I know that. The verbiage of real or fake, illusion or genuine, trick or legitimate isn't suited to video games. A computer is making me think there's a world inside of this flat screen. The whole thing is an unbelievably complicated illusion, a magic trick so impressive we don't even think about it. There is no staircase, there is no Babdi, there is no 14,000 square kilometers of post-apocalyptic wilderness. For the purposes of this video, I've made my scales of realness completely relative. The historical society's stairs are real only when compared to Mario 64. It goes back to what I said at the beginning. This is about what feels real, what emotionally registers as big. And in using this language so loosely, I think I've completely shot myself in the foot for the last game I want to talk about. Because the thing about An Orlando, the shining city atop the world of Dark Souls, is it's all an illusion. In lore, in the game's reality, what we are looking at is fake. The dazzling sunlight vanishes when questioned, the castle's polished halls fall into shadows, and it goes further, because under that illusion is another, kept in a crypt far beneath the throne room. A massive statue blocks the way, only to fade with the sun or in the presence of a special ring. When it disappears, it reveals, what else? A staircase down. But the stairs aren't the notable part here. Beyond the door at the bottom, lies Dark Sun Gwendolyn, one of my favorite Souls bosses purely for visual splendor. It is a fight based on illusion. Gwendolyn curses you for entering, and then throws the back of the hallway into the infinite, the statues on the wall repeating endlessly as they vanish into the horizon. The fight is one of the rare instances where Dark Souls transcends into the environmentally surreal, and accordingly, one of its most conceptual battles. Gwendolyn only has a few attacks, and no real close range ability. Instead, every time you get close, the boss teleports away, giving you time to only get in a few strikes before running again down the endless hallway. After Gwendolyn falls, the hall returns to normal. The end, and its ensuing rewards, are revealed to be just a few dozen yards away. On first blush, I assumed this hall was more or less like the Mario stairway. After all, that's what the imagery basically implies. You're trapped in an endless illusion, run all you want and you'll never escape. But that's not true. Going out of bounds during the cutscene reveals the normal hallway swapped for this. It's a combination of clever framing and brute force of scale. The original hall is replaced with a Wily Coyote style false ending, which is then shot down the new mile of architecture the game just spawned in. And this isn't just for looks. You can, if you are both stubborn and focused enough, take the boss fight all the way to the end of this passage. You can chase Gwendolyn until both of you are backed up against this brick wall all the way at the end, at which point the boss AI basically breaks. There is a canon ending to this fight. 
in which you push Gwendolyn's endless hallway until it falls apart, and then you just stand, swinging limply at each other, incredibly far from where you started. This is what's so fascinating about games, and so challenging about this language of real versus fake I've tried to build around it. Because we know it's an illusion. In the game, it's supposed to be a trick, and yet look at it! There it is, hundreds upon hundreds of statues in perfectly ordered rows, as or more real as anything else in the game. Gwendolyn faked the space. Dark Souls did not. The other day, I booted up Fuel. I told my computer to open all the countless miles of road from 2009, and I just started driving. It is an inherently silly thing to do, burn fake gasoline on the bluffs of a fake desert without so much as a fake objective to give me direction. But as false night passed into false day passed into false night again, I thought about movie scenes with the special effect of hundreds or thousands of real actors, the illusion of an entire world built temporarily for a single scene, the trick of genuine acrobatics, falls, explosions, captured once to be replayed again and again. As I drove through the artificial walls of a canyon constructed out of digital triangles from actual satellite data, I reflected on our ability to understand something as false and true at the same time, an artistic representation that tirelessly reproduces the space it simultaneously abstracts. There is no aesthetic failing in illusion. The success or failure of a project rests on its emotional communication, no matter the strategies used to achieve it. But still, knowing that when I walk down those stairs in Silent Hill 2, every step really exists before me sends a wonderful little chill down my spine. Knowing that there are no hollow buildings in Babdi makes the whole tiny city more enthralling. Every game fakes its space in one way or another. But I will always love stepping outside the bounds and marveling at how the trick might be that there's simply no trick at all. Okay, this wasn't an intentional connection for this essay, but I recently gave a talk in a real space for the very first time. Even if this talk is bad, please do not unsubscribe because <laughs> Last month, I was lucky enough to speak to a couple hundred people at the Durham Public Library in a talk I loosely titled, A Beginner's Guide to Game Analysis. Am I bragging a little? Sure, but I am also excited to tell you that the full recorded talk is now available on Nebula, both the scripted part of it and the 40 plus minutes of Q&A afterwards, featuring super thoughtful and interesting questions from the audience. Nebula sponsored this video, and Nebula has allowed me to do so much cool bonus content this year, from cooking videos to whole additional essays to now hosting my recording of this live talk. It's a healthier, more sustainable streaming ecosystem that I'm proud to be a part of. It's also, here's the thing you might not know, cheap! Follow my link in the description to get a solid 8 hours of exclusive content from me and countless hours of other creators' exclusive series, movies, classes, and more for just over 2 bucks a month. Doing a talk at a local library was a very specific dream of mine, but the fact that it was, you know, local, left a lot of people out. Now you too can see me walk through how I'd come up with an essay about Elden Ring, make jokes about Animorphs, and answer all sorts of great questions from an audience that y you can't see them in the video, but they are actually there, I promise. I wasn't just giving a talk in an empty room. You're gonna have to trust me on this one. Anyway, Nebula. Watch my talk, watch a whole heap of other exclusive videos, support creators like me for just over two bucks a month, and then... Go support your own local library. It's just a good thing to do.